Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Canola Producers Commission, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Girl. Welcome to Real Agriculture's Canola School series. I'm Kara Oosterhaus. In this episode, I've talked to Hector Carcamo, who is an entomologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge. Hector talks about the rise in numbers with diamondback moss across the prairies and how the weather has actually aided in their arrival. Hector also talks about economic thresholds, some control options, as well as what the diamondback moth actually does to your canola crop. Yes, uh, diamond back moth is a very interesting uh, insect that uh, sometimes it becomes a major pest in canola in, in the prairies. Uh, this insect, unlike other insects like lichen bugs, for example, uh, they are not native to Canada, or if they are native, they uh, overwinter here in very small numbers. So the populations that develop from these small numbers that do overwinter in Canada, they do not become the pest problem. The pest problem arises when we have this coincidence of having these uh, winds that come from the south, usually from the southeast of the U.S. or also even from northern Mexico. And the winds carry these uh, large populations of uh, moths, the diamondback moths, adults. And then we happen to get these showers of moths throughout the prairies. And if they happen to occur early on in the season, say in, uh, in early mid-May, when the canola is at the right stage, then we have the potential to have these large populations of diamond bag moths. And in some years, we are fortunate that we also get a parasitoid, a little wasp that is uh, called diadegma. And this wasp will actually come with the moth and they will take care of the problem for us. They, they will attack the larva and then the numbers will not be as high. Some years we are unlucky and we only get the pest coming uh, in these uh, this wind trajectories. And this is what has happened in 2017. We have seen in many parts of the prairies where we have very large populations of uh, diamond bag moth larvae that have developed, and they have been causing some damage in some fields. And, uh, what should growers do when they see diamond bag moth larvae in the field? Uh, first, I think we should talk about how do you know that it, it is the larva. And uh, in the field, when they're alive, they're very easy to recognize because they, they have this very funny behavior where the if you try to touch them, they actually will do a wiggle dance for you. So if they do that, you probably going to be a diamond back moth larva, but also they have a, a tapered end appearance. They're usually small green pale larva uh, once they reach their uh, mature stage. And they will go through several stages uh, as larva, and it's mostly the larger larva that will, that will do the, the uh, most damage. But the key factor to remember about diamond back moth is that they are usually not a pest when they're feeding on the foliage. So you can have a lot of uh, holes on canola foliage and they will usually tolerate that level of damage. It's when they finish feeding on the foliage and they start feeding on the pods, even at the flower stage. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on diamond back moth, I should mention, uh, but I don't think that uh, we have validated thresholds. Actually, I know that we do not have validated thresholds for diamond back moth at any of the stages, so this is something that needs to be done, but it's very difficult to do because we can never predict when we will have the, the uh, numbers to do the test. But when the larvae are feeding on the, on the foliage and uh, perhaps even some of the flowers, there may not be any yield penalties, any yield consequences. The problem is when they, there's no, there's, there are no more leaves on the plants and they start feeding on the pods. Uh, I think that is the key uh, sign to be looking for when you're going to make a decision about controlling them. Even if you have large numbers, but if you don't see damage in the pods, then uh, there's probably not going to be an issue. And also, at the earlier crop stages, there's a high chance that there could be parasitoids attacking the, the larva. Uh, so the key message, I guess, in my mind is to uh, be looking for the, those numbers at about two or three per plant, but later uh, during the late stages when the, the foliage is disappearing from the plants. The uh, economic thresholds we have for diamond back moth are nominal thresholds, which really means that there's no scientific data to support them. However, there is uh, experience, of course, from agronomists and growers and scientists that have been observing this damage. And the uh, recommended nominal threshold is two or three larvae per plant. And how we determine that threshold, how we estimate it, 
in the field is a bit of a challenge. It's not as easy as taking a strip net as we do for Ligus boats. So the, uh, the um, recommended method to sample diamond back moth is to actually pull the plants from a square foot. So you take a, a 30 by, by 30 centimeter area, take all the plants there, which usually is about 10 plants, and then you shake them on a, on a white cloth or on the hood of your truck or in a tray, and then count how many larvae you get. So if you're getting about 20 or 30 per 10 plants, it would suggest that you are close to the threshold, and then you might have to consider a, a control action. Uh, what they do is they start feeding on the surface of the pod, producing a scalding type of uh, damage, and you can actually see the damage quite easily, even from a distance when the damage is severe. The uh, top of the field, the pods will take a frosty, kind of white appearance, and uh, it is quite obvious. If you have low levels of damage, you, you, you probably want to take a control action before you reach that level. So you should be paying attention to your crop before that severe damage occurs. If you start to see large numbers of, uh, of larvae that are feeding on the pods and causing damage at the base of the pods, that's probably when you, you want to take a control action. Well, I, um, I think it's important that uh, producers actually take the time to sample. I'm just going to repeat this because uh, there is the temptation to go with sweep net samples. And remember when you're sweeping, say you take 10 sweeps in a canola field, you are going to be sampling uh, many, many plants. So before, and, and if you take, say, 10 sweeps, you will see maybe hundreds of larvae, but that might not be the right threshold. It's because you have 100 larvae in, in 10 sweeps. Uh, you need to keep in mind that the number of plants that you're sampling, even if you're not doing a, a very thorough sampling of the plants, you are actually uh, touching probably 100 plants in 10 sweeps. So it's important to, to actually get some information uh, based on the actual number per plant. <laughs>